So today, this morning, we are privileged to have Professor Slack from Hillsdale College uh, addressing us. And for those of you who may not have heard of Hillsdale College, it is a Christian classic, classical liberal arts college in Michigan. And they have many outstanding programs and several recognized graduate schools as well of, in statesman, statesmanship and government. So what they teach at Hillsdale College pairs very well with what we try to teach here in pre-law studies, where we're giving you a Christian view, a Christian perspective on law and government, and as well as uh, constitutional foundations. Professor Slack is a, an associate professor of politics at Hillsdale, and he's done extensive research on Benjamin Franklin and the art of virtue. So join me in welcoming Professor Slack, and we will uh, have some time for questions after his presentation. Professor Slack. Hello, can you hear me? Is it coming through? Well, happy Constitution Day. Nice uh, welcome, I guess, from Hillsdale to you here. Uh, and we have much to celebrate, right? The US Constitution is the longest lasting written functional constitution in history. Um, and that's important, written and functional. And I'll explain the importance of the written part uh, in just a minute. Uh, in one survey by one scholar, about half of the constitutions that he put together in a data set didn't last past 20 years. So it's pretty remarkable that we have one that's lasted some 200 years. Uh, and so uh, today is a fitting day, while Americans are used to debating politics, where we try to see what it is that we have in common, what makes us Americans. And I think that the founder that we should look to, somebody who was at the Constitutional Convention and one of only six to sign the Declaration as well as the Constitution, is Benjamin Franklin, arguably our most important founder. And founder in the most important sense, in the classical sense meaning that Franklin was concerned not just about the written laws, but also in shaping the habits of a people. The people, and the people are different from government. What are the moral virtues that make a people? What are their habits? And we'll get into some of that. Uh, and really the subject today of today's talk, the virtues of a free people. Uh, and just to foreshadow, uh, you have to have a moral populace in order to have political freedoms. If you don't have a moral populace, then a people cannot be self-governing. And that's what Franklin knew and tried to implement. Uh, so what are our views of Franklin? Well, if you're like me, when I was in high school, uh, you have a much better education than I got. I think of Franklin as kind of this uh, overweight, funny, witty guy, uh, obviously an eccentric genius. When they ask Americans uh, uh, who they would like to have a beer with, they usually list Franklin among all the other founders because he would have been wonderful in conversation. But we forget several things. One, that Franklin was actually young. He was young, vigorous, virile. He was a political leader. Uh, even a military leader, and I'll get into that in just a minute. He was also one of the two indispensable men for the American Revolution. Right? Historians often argue that we could not have won the revolution if it had not been for Franklin in Washington. And Franklin, because he's the one who secured the funding from the French government, the munitions, the arms, uh, and even the troops that helped us win uh, in the revolution against Britain. So there's three ways that I think Franklin helps us understand our Constitution, and I'll go over these now, the first one is politically. Franklin was a political leader. We usually think of James Madison or Thomas Jefferson, but uh, Franklin was one of the ones who helped formulate the ideas that would constitute the American regime. And I'll get into some examples of that. But number two, Franklin's lessons to an American people as to what the character should be. All of our ideas about Republican citizenship and the habits that we should have as Americans that serve as the basis for free government. And then number three, the idea of a vigorous civil society or a private sphere. Franklin was very active in forming these private associations in Philadelphia that constituted the real lifeblood of a people as opposed to a, a top-heavy central government that was always intervening uh, in the people's affairs. But let's begin. Uh, Franklin, in terms of being a political leader, the other founders like John Adams and James Madison credited Franklin with providing some of the seminal ideas for the US Constitution, meaning the American regime. John Adams said, it was only after reading Franklin's 1751 observations on the increase of mankind and the peopling of countries that he realized that there must be some kind of a break with Britain, that Americans were doubling in their population every 20 years 
and that eventually it would be the colonies that would be the seat of the power in the empire. And so certain political changes had to take place given the growth of those colonies. James Madison at the Constitutional Convention said that the theory of federalism is comprised, quote, in germ in Franklin's letters to William Shirley, one of the generals in 1754 and a governor of Massachusetts. There Franklin uh, laid out his idea of consent as being necessary uh, for just government. So let's talk about three basic ways that Franklin is important and our own idea of what good government looks like that was instilled in the Constitution. The first is this notion of social contract. You've all probably had to go over this at some point, but it's a seminal idea. Social contract is the notion that the people themselves are sovereign as opposed to a government or a ruling class. Uh, Franklin, uh, his boyhood hero was a man named John Wise. He was a minister at Ipswich. John Wise was over six feet tall. He was described as a powerful wrestler. And John Wise was asked to implement some of the tyrannical policies under the British government after the creation of the Dominion of New England in 1684. Uh, some of you may not be familiar with that. That's where uh, the king was tired of the colonists' practices of self-rule and ignoring some of the dictates from Britain. And so they decided they would simply take away their self-rule. And they collapsed all the New England colonies into one called the Dominion of New England that be ruled over by a military governor. Uh, and so John Wise, this local leader, was asked to come in and help to collect the revenues from the people without their consent. And he was hauled before a judge because he refused. And there John Wise, he claimed all of the rights that he had as a British subject. He, he claimed the Magna Carta and the elements of the unwritten law. And the judge looked at him and he said, John Wise, you have a right not to be sold for a slave. That's it. All of the rights the colonists thought they had, they really did not have any of them. And that gets to uh, one of the seminal, the seminal uh, the building blocks of our Constitution. That's the idea of citizenship or a sovereign people as opposed to the idea of subjects. Those are very different things. Under the British Empire, you were accorded various privileges and obligations based upon your assigned group identity in overlapping identities. Whether you were a nobleman, whether you were gentry, whether you were a commoner, laborer, or whether you were in the realm of England, or whether you were a colonist. The colonists could not claim the common law rights of the realm of England because they weren't subjects of that realm. What did it mean? It meant that they had no rights that the British government had to respect. Rather, they were accorded to them by the king through prerogative power or parliament. So, John Wise was Benjamin Franklin's boyhood hero. He grew up admiring John Wise and the other men who were around his brother's newspaper the New England Current, and they were uh, talking about these kinds of ideas in politics, and one of them being social contract theory. So social contract theory is where the people themselves are sovereign. All the individuals contract with one another. Uh, it's not that the government gives them rights. Rather, the people already possess rights by nature, and they create government to protect those rights. That's the basic idea of the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Franklin was on that committee and inserted some of the phrases we know today. The idea of self-evident truths was Franklin's addition, one of them, to that document. So in social contract theory, Franklin is writing about it uh, in 1729. Uh, one of the important applications of social contract theory, Franklin applies in 1747. Franklin, rising up uh, as, uh, as a tradesman in Philadelphia, uh, he sees how the Quakers who dominate the assembly refuse to raise taxes for the defense of the people. Well, this is one of the basic functions of government. So how do you apply social contract theory? It's not something just simply abstract. Uh, rather, Franklin, in realizing that there's no funds, the proprietors who uh, are in control of the colony and they're the ones who appoint the governor are not going to raise funds unless they are exempted from taxation. Franklin says, we are now in a state of nature. The state of nature was any time, in the American founder's idea, any time that human beings interacted without properly functioning government. So in other words, you call the police, they're not coming. Or you have an invading army, in this case, in King George's War, the French sailing up the Delaware, or the Indian allies on the frontier. So what do you do? Franklin writes this pamphlet that's very successful, and he says to all the different groups in Philadelphia, come and unite with us. It's only going to be us, the middling artisans, who can defend ourselves. So contract with us for the protection of life, liberty, and property. 
So in 1747, there you have the idea that it's already present that would later be appealed to in the Declaration of Independence, where the people are sovereign, and they're the ones who, lacking a proper uh, response by government, they have to act for themselves. And so Franklin, in this case, creates an extra legal militia. There was no legal basis for it at all to build the defenses along the Delaware River, river to protect the inhabitants of Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. Uh, so we have this idea of social contract theory that presupposes the idea of equality. Right? Equal citizens under the law as opposed to those who are subjects. Now equality comes first. All of your rights that you possess, and think about the basic ideas of political freedoms, you presuppose an equality first. And why is that? Well, because if you're not equal, then you can be ruled without your consent. Some of you are very tired of this. Your parents can rule you without your consent. There are all kinds of things you can't do. Right? You can't what, drink, smoke, chew, run with those who do. You can't drive a car. You can't have sex. You can't do all these things that require a certain age limit. And then the reason fairy comes and sprinkles some pixie dust on you, and then you become rational, and now you can be held as accountable for your actions. But you're presupposing that rationality and those abilities. So equality comes before liberty, and this is the basis of equal citizenship. Now. When Franklin rises into the political, uh, the political realm in Pennsylvania, in 1751 he joins the assembly. He was a lawmaker long before the other founders. Some of them were even born. Here he was, the leader of the popular party in Pennsylvania. Uh, and there Franklin is fighting the proprietors who claimed a special rank. The same thing you would have found in Britain. They said, we are of a special rank. We are nobles. We are the proprietors. And this means that we have certain rights and certain obligations you do not have, and this means we can exempt ourselves from taxation. And so Franklin, appealing to natural law and natural rights, is going to lead the charge against the proprietors in Pennsylvania in the 1750s. And he lays out much of the theory that Madison is referring to in germ that's the basis for our Constitution. Uh, and it's then that Franklin writes these 1754 letters uh, to William Shirley. What do they argue in brief? Well, they argue that just government always requires the consent of the people. Right? This was not always so. But Franklin did it in his typical witty and ironic way. Uh, and so in the first letter, there's three of them to Governor Shirley, he says, well, consent may not be necessary. And so he prepares this pseudo aristocrat for the possibility that maybe the people should be included in a new union of the colonies to defend against the French and the Indians. Maybe they shouldn't. But by the third letter, what we find is Franklin is saying, this is a right that all of the colonists have under the British Constitution and under the ideas of universal justice. So equal citizenship. The third, I think, important contribution Franklin makes, and this is the pamphlet referenced by John Adams, is the question of what gives rise to a growing people. What are the laws or the policies that make a people thrive? And here Franklin would have all of these ideas and publish them, and it was a very famous pamphlet. Uh, and the, uh, the basic criterion was this. Do the people of your country want to procreate? Do they want to grow? And do you have the right policies that encourage that? Uh, do, are you giving them security of property? Um, do they have the right habits? Is there a right religion? Franklin said certain religious sects give rise to industrious and frugal habits where people save money, making the allowance for larger families, and now you can double your population every 20 years. Uh, and here is where he opposes the immigration policies in Pennsylvania. There were too many Germans coming over, said Franklin, and so we need to deregulate the number of Germans so that we can increase the local inhabitants in Pennsylvania. So all of these ideas Franklin is contributing, and they would become the basis for an opposition to the British government itself. After all, Britain was making the same claim as the proprietors, that the colonists were subjects. They were not citizens. They did not have any natural rights. Think about it. If all of your rights come from the parliament or some long, unwritten tradition, that means that parliament can, through parliament will be the arbiter of what your rights mean. And that means you don't have any security of rights at all. And so Franklin, representing Pennsylvania, will then take part in the disputes with the British Empire over the Stamp Act uh, and the other duties that were levied against the colonies. So referring to the kind of habits that grow a people leads me to number two, and that is Franklin is the founder in the most important sense. 
in the classical sense, meaning Aristotle, Plato, the way the ancients viewed the word founder, and that is somebody who actually gives rise to certain habits that make a people what they are. If you've traveled abroad, then you know what I'm talking about. As different as all of us are in this room and all over this country, if you ever see an American abroad, all of a sudden it's like you met your long lost cousin and you realize how much you actually have in common with those people that you never would have thought of uh, when you were in the United States. Why is that? There's a certain kind of character that Americans have. And Franklin had argued that it was that character that if properly nursed would be the basis for free government. Um, and so when we say the word constitution, remember it's not just laws. Constitution literally means you. The constitution, meaning your mental constitution and the habits that you possess that are all shaped in a way by the laws themselves. One way you see a decline of democracy is that. You can learn about democracy all day long in a classroom. If you never actually practice it, you never form the habits of a democratic people. You don't know what it's like to believe you have certain rights and to challenge even the authorities who try to exercise power over you when they violated those rights. So that's the kind of constitution uh, that I'm referring to uh, and makes Franklin so important. Uh, one of the claims that he makes several times is, is only a moral people is capable of freedom. This is a comment made by all of the American founders. James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, you name them. Now let's get this right. What they're not saying is what a lot of pseudo-aristocrats will say, which is this. Well, people are vicious and they're degraded. We've got to rule them without their consent. That's not what the founders meant. What they meant was this. When a people loses their virtue, when they become vicious in their habits, they want to be ruled like slaves. But what does that mean? Well, here you can go back to the ancient understanding. You can be ruled politically by honor and shame, which requires your own self-control, or you must be ruled by force. And the, the way the, the Aristotle described it was like the lower animals. What does that mean? By pleasure and pain. So you can either have people who are self-controlled and they all aspire in a common mind to a certain way of life and they further that way of life and they have freedoms most of all from their own passions first and foremost that allow them to have the political freedoms they do or people will be controlled like sheep by pleasure and pain. And so Franklin is trying to educate the, the colonists in the right moral habits so that they can be capable of their freedoms. And so this is how he is going to uh, be, I think, the most important founder. Um, what kind of freedoms is he instilling? Uh, you know, a good example of this. If you ever see the news about Mardi Gras in New Orleans, there's an example of people ruled by police, right? So people who are not in their right minds and they're governed by pleasure and pain. You can have an entire society that acts in that particular way if they lack moral virtue. Franklin had in mind a combination of different virtues, ancient, Christian, and what that meant was, was the ancient virtues of courage and temperance, uh, and uh, uh, courage, temperance, wisdom. Uh, these are the things that he wanted to include, um, but yet he wanted a Christian understanding, meaning, meaning that there would be uh, a growth by commerce as opposed to conquest, and the ancient Romans, the ancient Greeks. Uh, it also meant uh, that he wanted a society of charity, so Franklin is behind the creation of the hospital in 1751 in Philadelphia, as opposed to the cruelty of the ancients, meaning that it's only in the Christian attempt to understand immutable God, right? The idea of universal laws, to get to know God by science, that Christianity births a whole experimental science that was unknown to ancient man. And so Franklin is going to provide a list of virtues, probably one of the most well-published pieces in American history, to teach the Americans, the colonists uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, and the American citizens themselves, what kind of habits they needed so that they could have their political freedoms. Let me give you a good example before I begin. Uh, Franklin writes an essay in 1789 about freedom of speech. And at that time, in the papers, there were all kinds of scurrilous materials that were being written, making fun of candidates, but making fun of them as individuals. Today, we would call that libel, where you defame somebody's reputation. You do not have a right to do this. And Franklin said, well, you can have freedom of speech, but if your freedom of speech means that you can slander somebody's character or that you can libel them in the newspapers, he says, then there's another kind of freedom, the freedom of the cudgel. What does that mean? Well, a cudgel, a blunt instrument. If you have a society where there's no self-control, 
You are birthing a society where people will simply begin to brawl and to fight because they have no constraint morally and therefore need to be constrained uh, by one another, if not politically. So what are some of the ways that Americans need to be moral? Well, the first way, Franklin has 13 virtues, is self-control, basic asceticism. And his virtues here are temperance, silence, and order. Silence is the one we usually don't think about. Temperance meaning you have control, self-control with regard to food or drink. Silence is the one that's a bit odd. But here Franklin, in part of his personal testimony, but also trying to teach people uh, on how they can be happy, is pointing out how he himself was terrible at first in conversation. You know people like this. In disputes, he was always proving people wrong. He was always making fun of the things that they said. He was given over to uh, punning and lampooning them. And so one of the virtues that's hard for him to acquire, he says it does damage to his inclinations, violence to his inclinations, is silence. When he's at a table, instead of giving over to the temptation to simply talk and dominate the conversation, Franklin makes himself shut up and listen to people. And he says this has all these wonderful effects. First of all, he actually learns from them. Other than being, as somebody told him, overbearing, where nobody wanted his company, uh, other than being that way, Franklin actually courted their company. And Franklin then could exchange information with them. It helped him, he said, to persuade other people uh, so that they would agree with him, whereas if he had been obnoxious, they wouldn't have agreed at all. And finally, pleasure in conversation. Think about it, when you talk to somebody, do they leave the conversation thinking, oh, that was nice, I'd like to talk to that person again. Sometimes that's not the case. So for Franklin, silence was this important virtue in restraining his natural inclinations. And then order, right? This is the third virtue. The idea that in ordering the world around you, you get used to habits of responsibility that prepare you for greater tasks in life. The second three virtues, so self-control, but the second three have to do with self-respect and the esteem of man. So it's not enough just to restrain yourself. Rather, Franklin knows that human beings are proud creatures. And so how do you construct a society where they esteem themselves, they, they have a measure of perfection, and inwardly they feel a sense of satisfaction that they've achieved that to some degree, just a little bit, and other people recognize their excellence. And so there are three virtues here. One is resolution, the second is industry, and the third is frugality. Resolution for Franklin, he says, is fortitude. This is one of the ancient, the four cardinal virtues. We don't think of Franklin as being a military leader, but he actually was. Uh, and this is not just in the creation of this militia in King George's War, but in the French and Indian War. At different points, he was called general or colonel, and he's the one who led the creation of the blockhouses and the forts in the Pennsylvania frontier. He had men die under his command. Uh, 20 men that he sent on ahead were killed by an estimated 250 Indians that ambushed them while crossing a river. And then, as he moved through the small towns, he saw the carnage, all those who were scalped and slaughtered on the frontier towns. Franklin notes in his autobiography how his men were under constant watch by the enemy. In fact, the last written word that he leaves in the Pennsylvania Gazette is, is to die in our country's cause is the sweetest of all deaths. So we don't think of Franklin in that sense. A big guy, right? Almost six feet tall, barrel chested. But that was Franklin as a military leader. When he constructed the fortifications along the Delaware, he bragged that he took his turn at the wall like all the other men. But more importantly than military courage, he says, is the courage in little things in society. Being a firefighter, being a police officer, in 1733, he writes Brave Men at Fires, and he says, it's the kind of courage that citizens have to rush into a building that's on fire and to save them as one of their community. He says, that's the kind of courage that makes possible the 42-4, he says, a siege or a storm, meaning the warfare tactics back in the day. Then we think of industry and frugality. These are usually thought of as virtues that help you get rich quick, and I think that's a misconception we have about Franklin. It's all about self-interest properly understood. But what he meant by those virtues was something more complicated. By industry, he meant that you were ordering the world around you. And the harder that you work, the more wealth that you create. And that goes hand in hand with the ordering principle of mind. In one description of Philadelphia, he describes the conquest of the taming of a wilderness as turning it into a garden. And so ordering the world around you is hand in hand with this acquisitive instinct that human beings have, right? To build wealth, 
But it's not enough just to create wealth. He talks about frugality. Frugality meaning that you save the wealth that you create. Now, everyone is different, radically different in terms of their natural dispositions and virtues. It means some people will be more industrious and have more things. It also means that those people can afford to be less frugal. But for those who work hard, then they should learn to save more. Frugality wasn't just being a penny pincher, though, right? A penny saved is a penny earned. Frugality says, most importantly, means a kind of frugality of mind, where you train yourself to do without the things that your pride tells you you should have. And so these are the virtues that gain esteem uh, in, um, that gain esteem for the citizens. Most importantly, he'll say about industry and frugality, they make you free from debt. And so this was a, a problem at that time, it's a problem now, right? We have record levels of student debt, record levels of credit card debt. And so these are the things that make you free from your creditors, these practices uh, of industry and frugality. Next, Franklin talks about virtues of public ambition public spiritedness, and I'll briefly uh, go over these, but then move down. What are these? Well, virtues of sincerity, justice, and moderation. And then these individuals who have esteem that jockey with one another as to who's respected in the community. Franklin wants to unify with his last virtues of cleanliness, tranquility, and chastity. Some of these seem very abstract, but take a virtue like cleanliness. What Franklin meant here was taking pride in your community and making sure that it's clean. Here he's opposing one of the other views by a famous philosopher, Mandeville, who talked about all of the dirt of London was really the cause of the great wealth of London. He wanted to celebrate what he called private virtues, selfishness. Franklin wants to change that. And he talks about rather cleanliness, meaning you can harmonize the individual with the clean streets of Philadelphia, the self-interest with the interest of the entire community. So how do we try to implement these virtues? Franklin will say the laws themselves. We can connect the Constitution, meaning the virtues of a people, with the Constitution, meaning the laws of the land. How so? Well, you organize them to reward the right behaviors. If you have the right laws, you encourage people to confront necessity, and they receive more of the wealth that they create. So in other words, you give them an incentive to work hard because they keep more of the profits. That has to do with the actual laws, as opposed to a kind of shakedown scheme, right? Where you have government that overly taxes the citizenry, and you have people that become parasites on the body public, the body politic, and parasite off those people who work really hard. So for Franklin, you needed the right laws, but it also referred to honor. This was far more important, Franklin thought, even than wealth. Think about why you got up and did the things you do today. I'm so glad I'm not your age anymore. I don't have to, I'm married with five kids. I don't care about what other women think. Uh, I am happy uh, and I don't care about the clothes I wear. Obviously my hair turned white. I don't care what that looks like anymore. So I just cut it all off. I don't have to comb it. Honor and shame are the currency of our social relations. And so if you want to have the right habits in a community, make sure you honor the right things, as opposed to honoring the things uh, that lead people uh, in the wrong decisions. Uh, for example, in certain neighborhoods where getting rich quick, taking advantage of other people, those are the kind of habits people form, where they can be lazy, and that behavior is encouraged. Franklin is saying, we need to shame those behaviors, and that can be done by the laws. One way is to publicly reward those people who have contributed to your community, right? Those people who are of true merit and have done services to others, make them recognizable, give them honor publicly in the society. Uh, one more thing I should touch on before, uh, and that is Franklin wanted a large, what he called middling element. Middling element meaning a middle class, and he thought that the right kind of laws would encourage a middle class. Uh, why a middle class? Why is a large middle class so important? Well, number one, you're going to have a popular government. But Franklin argued, the people who are wealthiest in this society, if you give them all power, what do they tend to do? They tend to accumulate more wealth and power into their own hands. If you have a large number of those who are disgruntled, the rabble, what do they do with power? They try to redistribute the wealth of the wealthy. A middle class doesn't view itself in terms of uh, being jealous and wanting the wealth of the wealthy because they see themselves as on their way up, they're climbers. And if they practice the right virtues and your laws are properly constructed, they will be rewarded for practicing those virtues. 
So they're not angry at those who are above them in society. But also they have a kind of shame for those who are poor. The idea is, is you need to practice the virtues that we practiced, and then you can get ahead too. So this was a seminal part of Franklin's social theory. The last point I don't have time to get into, I'd like to open up for questions, but let me briefly touch on it. And that is civic mindedness. Insofar as Franklin is trying to teach the habits of a people, right? The people, not government, the folkways, it means that he wants them to be civic minded, to participate in government, and to love their to love their communities. So when we talk about constitution, we're not just talking about the Republican government writ large, the federal government, but representative government at the state level, at the local level, the school districts that we have, and the habits that are forged at the nearest level to those citizens will then be displayed all the way on up to the top. Okay, so in conclusion, when we think about Constitution Day, think about Constitution as the character that we have. And secondly, think about the Constitution not just in terms of our national Constitution, but the Republican habits uh, that we share at every single level of self-government. Thank you very much. microphone, but for the benefit of everyone in this room, as well as those who will watch on video later, uh, I'm going to just come alongside and ask a question. So put up your hand if you have a question, Jonathan, I'll come to you first. Actually, I know you're comfortable with the mic, so why don't I just pass it over to you? So I want to ask, do you think that Benjamin Franklin would have supported a strong central government or a weaker central government? Yeah, Franklin, uh, He's one of the authors of the Albany Plan in 1754, which means he's the one who comes up with this idea of the Union of Colonies. And interestingly there, there is a delegation of, of power over certain objects to this colonial authority that was supposed to meet in all the colonies. It never took off. But what it means is he has this idea uh, of the self-government, right, at the state level and the local level, but then delegating certain objects for control to a centralized authority, and that, of course, is what Madison is referring to as the, the germ of federal government that he finds uh, in Franklin's earlier writings. So how do we have it today, right? Well, it's changed quite a bit, as you know, if you're a con law student, but in the original Constitution, we delegate so, uh, certain authorities to Congress in Article One, Section 8. And the older understanding was, if it ain't in that list, Congress doesn't have the power to do it. So you give Congress power, national Congress, over certain objects, and then you leave the vast bulk of governance to the states and to the local uh, governments. And there you have your ninth and 10th uh, amendments, right? The power is reserved to the people or to the, respectively to the states. question and here obviously very speculative I think that well what Franklin said at the Constitutional Convention was he says the natural form of government is kingship he said what tends to happen is is that you end up moving from a democratic or Republican government to an oligarchy and so you have the rule of the few the power of the country is wrapped up in the hands of a few people and he says then what happens well, he says then the majority of people, he says they'd rather be, because they're proud, we're all proud. That's how human, Franklin understood human nature. He says, then the majority of people would say to themselves, I'd rather be ruled by one unequal to me than by a few people unequal to me, right? That, that comments of, I'd rather be ruled by, ruled by one tyrant 3,000 miles away than 3,000 pirates one mile away. Uh, I think Franklin would first uh, be concerned about the habits that he sees, right? Um, the idea, of, of the, the idea of the lack of asceticism and self-control. Uh, working hard, getting ahead. Let me give you an example. Uh, uh, my parents never went to college, right? Uh, and they all worked, they worked hard, two, three jobs and so on. Um, what happens to people like that when you have a monetary system that we have today, something similar to that, where it's a fiat currency, um, and there's a constant price paid to the average person in inflation? So what happens to that person who works hard? Well, you actually give them a disincentive to work hard because the money they try to save is taxed in inflation. 
I think Franklin would be concerned about the habits we have, right, as a people, and I think that would also correlate to the very expansive government we have in fulfilling all these tasks that really people should be doing for themselves. So I, yeah, and the warning would be what? The warning would be, oh, well, you may end up with a majority of people who are gonna flock to one leader, a demagogue, as opposed to being governed by an oligarchy. Okay, to give the people on this side of the room an opportunity to have a question. Do you think there's someone in our government today that is doing the same characteristics that Franklin did? Do we still have those characteristics, that, that character? I think yes. I mean, I mean, all cards on the table here. I'm a fan of Ron DeSantis, your, your governor here. But let me give you an example. When you see how Americans respond to laws, it is remarkable. It is remarkable how quickly they can respond. I'll give you an example. Uh, in the state of Maine, uh, they, they, uh, they introduced a law. This is uh, several years ago. They introduced a law that said if you are receiving uh, welfare entitlements to food, right, food stamps, uh, that you have to show that you're actively looking for a job. When they did that, the, uh, the food stamp rolls dropped by 80% in a year. What was the point? The point was is all the incentives were there for people to take advantage of the program and not to look for a job. Uh, I noticed this with friends after the Great Recession many, many years ago, uh, where if they had unemployment benefits, uh, they would milk those in unemployment benefits for all they were worth, and they would wait until they ran out about two weeks before, and then they'd start looking for a job. So uh, can you... Can you direct people towards the right habits? I think so. And when I look at Americans today, I see they do have the right habits. Now I'm all cards on the table. I'll give you an example. Where I'm from is this little rural area called Hillsdale. And when the government, and this is the government of Michigan, issued all these edicts, constitutionally or not, that's debatable, about mask mandates and the health regulations, people in my county just said, sorry, not doing it. Friends, what was that? That was the idea of you have overreached, and so what's demanded now is a kind of civil disobedience. So do you still have that notion of self-government, the idea of we govern ourselves, we elect our local leaders to make determinations for us? That's what you see. You had a prosecutor who refused to prosecute. Why? Well, as he told the state health authorities, I'm not going to prosecute the local restaurant until you tell me to prosecute Home Depot because I'm going to prosecute the law insofar as it's real law, meaning universal, and necessary, those two key, key criteria of law. So I think we do see some of those, uh, those habits today. The question is, is how do you reinvigorate them? And it's never a done process, right? As a parent knows, this is what you try to instill into your own child, or at a school like this, how you try to educate the next generation. Well, I mean, you, your, your question has really two components. One is, is if you look at, say, the Electoral College, what was the basis for that, right? So can you, can you lose the popular vote and still win the presidency? You all know yes, right? And uh, why was that? Well, it was part of the arrangements made with states to enter into the union in the first place. Uh, the second is a more complicated uh, question to answer, and I'll give you my answer. Um, and that is, if you go back to the founding period, there's a strong tradition people like James Otis of citing John Locke or Benjamin Franklin himself, as to the limits of government meaning, the government cannot transfer its lawmaking power away. If the people are sovereign, it means that that sovereignty has to be returned to them periodically in elections. So there has to be some point in your political order where the people decide who their elected representatives are 
and only those elected representatives are allowed to make laws for the whole people. That's called the non-delegation doctrine. It still is valid jurisprudence, although everybody knows that it's really not applied much anymore. So it's the second part of your question. It is, you're right, most of the, what we call laws, are they really laws? That's debatable. In other words, you have a 2,000 page bill, say the Affordable Care Act. You have a bill that's passed at 1,600 pages and in the bill itself, there's a requirement for different administrative agencies to implement the bill in 42 different key areas. So that's not law. Um, so if the bureaucracy is sovereign today, then the only way to get back to a true self-government would be to try to limit the bureaucracy. One way to do that would be uh, to, try to, to try to remove bureaucrats that are partisan. Right? There are different attempts that, uh, to do that, the Hatch Act and so on. But it would also be to try to limit the life tenure that bureaucrats have. Insofar as bureaucrats themselves openly will say, if we don't agree with it, now we are going to be the resistance in the government to stop Donald Trump or whoever's elected because we have our own interest. The problem with that is, and this would be a big common view in the American founding period, is you can end up with a faction inside of government itself with no check on behalf of the people. So that's a real problem. How do you do away with lifetime tenure bureaucrats who have taken sovereignty to themselves and who work with elected officials to benefit themselves? Uh, it's very, very far cry from what we would call Republican government or, dem or Democratic government at all. Right? If so, if the people, right, you say the majority wins an election but has no real say as to how their will will be carried out, then that's a real problem. Oh, definitely, right? Um, <laughs> and it happens in several broad movements. We use these words progressive, liberal, radical, and so on. You could actually trace those to different historical time periods and different views as to what the proper end of government are. Let me give you an example. Most government was local really until the New Deal, so 1929 to 1945. Uh, you can actually look at a percentage of non-military expenditures and you can see that the role of the federal government and local government completely flips, right? Whereas the federal government, all I want to say is 20, 30 percent of non-military total expenditures. Uh, local government was something like 60 percent. Those roles are flipped by the end of the New Deal. So you lose some of the virtues that you had prior to that. Some would argue of necessity, but you can compare the statement of, of Franklin Roosevelt to Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin believed that virtue required a confrontation with necessity. What does that mean? It meant that as a young person, you ought to be forced to confront the threats of old age and sickness and to set aside money for a nest egg for those periods of time in your life, right? To, and that would lead you to practice industry and frugality. The statement made by FDR is necessitous men are not free men. What that meant was, was the confrontation of necessity meant that you yourself were not free, and so government needed to step up and provide for you. The Social Security Act, right, 1935. So we have a change in the function of government and the creation of the first, I think, properly what we call the welfare state. You also have another major shift 30 years later, and that's in the 1960s, and probably the most important shift in America, and that is we change our understanding of what the family should be. One of probably the most important laws that were passed was no-fault divorce. What does that mean? It means that you don't have to show fault to get a divorce. So for most of American history, it was really hard to get a divorce. You had to prove fault. Um, the elites of the country said, we really don't like that. So you had the elites, I talk about the importance of the people in this room. There's people at the American Bar Association, uh, feminists, Herman Hill K, people like that, who helped draft the uniform divorce law that was adopted by different states. What it meant was you could have divorce based on irreconcilable differences. As long as you agree with who gets what and where the kids go, you don't have to prove fault for a divorce. What did it mean? It meant that divorce skyrocketed. So you move from what was already kind of a high divorce rate that had lowered in the 1950s, the late 50s, about 20%. Of course, after the Civil War, it was one out of every 22 marriages. After the no-fault divorce laws in the 80s, 50%. What does that mean? It means that we have a, a certain model for marriage among elites in our society, and then a model for everybody else, which is to say they don't get married at all. 
right? So if you look at illegitimacy, probably the biggest crisis in terms of families. Uh, and it means those who are on the bottom half, uh, um, the majority of adults in America are not married today. Well, that's a problem if you want a society where people raise kids, have a view to what a better society would be for those children often in the future. So now, uh, you know, in all the business magazines, Forbes, Business Insider would agree, marriage is a luxury for those who go to the right schools. And so uh, we have a new model of marriage that really doesn't benefit everybody. I would say that change in behavior is probably one of the most important, uh, where there's an open support of very hedonistic behaviors. I think for one more question, and then if you're going to have lingering questions after Bell, you're welcome to stay on. I also want to just quickly announce I like for the pre law ambassadors to stay also for a photo after this last question. And once Bell rings and we're, we're wrapped up, for those of you who are going on to your next class, we do have a breakfast uh, on the go breakfast treat for you in honor of Class of Future Day. Taylor? So we all know the idea that you have to give up some personal rights for overall freedom. At what point do you think that becomes unconstitutional, or does it? That you have to give up some personal rights. Some individual rights for freedom. Like yeah, I mean, give up some rights for freedom. that's a great question. I, I think that the way that all the, fact, and I'm sure here you are, the con law program, James Wilson is probably the most important jurist of the founding era. He, era, he writes the lectures on law, published in 1802. Uh, for Wilson, uh, your rights always correlate to certain duties. And so you had natural rights that you always had a right to. Uh, what are the rights that you lay aside to enter into the social contract? Those were called the alienable rights. And so what were some of those? Well, for example, the idea that you could enforce the laws of nature your, yourself. Uh, we all know what that means, something like, you wake up and there's somebody stealing your television set in your house, you are in the state of nature, you can kill them, particularly in a state like Florida, as I understand. Uh, however, well, why? John Locke brings up the example. He says, because you don't know why they're there. And, you know, you wake up, and there's some guy, and he says, don't worry, I'm here just to steal your TV, but I'll leave after that. Really? Uh, you don't know that. And so you're in a state of nature, there's no police. Now, if you wake up and you see him running down the street with your television set, you can't follow him home and shoot him in the back. You lay aside your right to enforce the laws of nature on your own. You have to then trust the police to do it. Most of the things that we would call rights today, the founders would not have called rights that you, uh, for example, obscenity, the idea, uh, or vulgarity. They had blasphemy laws in the founding period. That was not deemed to be a violation of anybody's natural rights to freedom of speech, even though that was deemed to be one of your natural rights. Uh, so the difference between liberty and license, I think, is the proper answer to your question. And many of the things we would call liberty today, the founders would have said, no, that's basically license. You don't have the right to do that. Let's thank Professor Slack for joining us.